And also, car tracking devices could lower insurance rates for Alberta drivers. This is in Canada, and it's a, it's a, it's a PR piece. It's a promo piece, actually, when you read it. It's been a handout, as far as I can see. And... Um, it's a rah-rah thing of how it'll lower your insurance rates if you, if you want one of these devices and put in your car or your vehicle. It says telematics devices installed in cars could reward more co- See, this are, see, this are, <laughs> this are, these are, you know, the psycholinguistic words. Could reward more cautious Alberta drivers. That's right in the first line. That, that's your grabber for, for the folk to suck into it. With, with lower insurance rates. The province is currently studying whether to allow the voluntary devices which are already being used in Quebec. And it says, uh, it says the technology is allowing the motorists to see exactly how good they really are and the insurance company is keen to see such devices allowed in Alberta. The province is currently studying it and uh, if and when such technology termed telematics could be green-lighted. It's already in place in Quebec, and the insurance industry believes it's just a matter of time before all provinces follow that lead across Canada. Heather Mark, Director of Government Relations for the Alberta branch of the Insurance Bureau of Canada, said the industry is waiting to see how the government will regulate the technology. Now, I'll guarantee you, uh, once I've got everybody on this thing and make it law, then, uh, then the insurance companies will just jack up all their rates again, because they have to maximize their profits too. And they've done this unilaterally in Canada, uh, just when they say there's not enough money coming in, or there's not, you know, etc. They just jack it all up out of sight. We're one of the highest paying insurance for vehicles in the world, really, is in Canada. So they're not going to lower their prices for very long, believe you me. If it's for a little while, it's for, uh, it's for a, a, a plan, basically an economic plan. And then about two years after that, once it's all across the border, everyone's got this device and they'll jack up their insurance again. They're, going to lo- they're not going to lose money. I don't care how good a driver you, you are. It's not going to happen, folks. But just to get everybody under surveillance is the real reason for all of this. But I'll put the link up tonight at cuttingtrudematrix.com. And also, members of the European Parliament, it says, this is, this is going to be the big thing, folks, the reading for the crashes. And, and the plundering of bank accounts. Members of the European Parliament vote to protect small bank depositors, it says. And it says the bail-in of any creditors should be done according to a clear hierarchy with depositors with savings over 100,000 euros last in line, while deposits under 100,000 euros would be fully protected, said Green Economic and Finance spokesman Philip Lamberts in a statement. I wonder what the ethnic group that is, Green. Anyway, it says the votes amended um, the European Commission's bank recovery and resolution proposal. So they're really pushing it, and that's from the EU, uh, from their, their bank system. And then you find that uh, Bank for International Settlements and the IMF attacks on quantitative easing, that's your inflation, uh, deeply misguided war monetarists. So monetarists across the world have warned that the International Monetary Fund, that's the big boys that were set up by the Royal Institute of International Affairs, a private organization, CFR, and the Bank for International Settlements, same, same group, are making a historic error by calling for a withdrawal of emergency stimulus before the global economy has fully recovered. So they warned against uh, ever more uh, monetary policy activism to keep the global econ- economy afloat. It called on the U.S., Britain, Japan, and Eurozone to restore interest rates to normal levels sooner rather than later. And the two watchdogs landed broadsides against Central Bank largest last week. It says that the BIS, the Forum of Central Banks, was particularly blunt, seeming to imply that quantitative easing does not work. Critics say that risks undermining the credibility of radical measures when more uh, may ne- yet be needed. They fear central banks could repeat the mistake made in 1937 when the Federal Reserve lost its nerve and tightened too soon, tipping America back into depression. The Bank for International Settlements and the IMF are deeply misguided and risk doing the world a grave disservice. The biggest threat right now is irrational fear of, fear of bubbles amongst central banks, said Lars um, Christensen, a monetary theorist at the Dansk Bank. How can they criticize the Bank of Japan for pulling the country out of 15 years of deflation and the longest asset price collapse in modern history? Mr. Christian said deflationary forces are stalking the global economy, making it essential to offset budget cuts with monetary stimulus. The U.S. is tightening fiscal policy by 2% of GDP this year, and the most in half a century. So they're not happy with the IMF and the BIS, but the BIS wants to have a crush so that they can take full power 
over the planet, folks. That's the big agenda. That's what they were set up to, to do in the first place by the private organization, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Council on Foreign Relations. That's who created them and still runs them to do this very thing, to take over the world. And also, this article too has to do with um, the Obama administration denial of asylum for a German homeschool family. Now, you've seen he's given a blanket asylum for all the illegal uh, immigrants that came in and from Mexico. Uh, but so uh, one family came from Germany and it says, Today the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the Obama administration's denial of asylum granted to you and Hanlower Romik and their six children. The Romiks fled, fled Germany in 2008 when they were subjected to criminal prosecution for homeschooling. In Bissingen, district of Ludwigsburg, Baden-Württemberg, they faced exorbitant fines, forcible removal of their children, possible imprisonment, all for homeschooling their children. And a Christian, see, they're Christian, unfortunately, in Germany. And Germany's not run by, I would say, Germans. The Supreme Court of Germany declared that the purpose of the German ban on homeschooling was to counteract the development of religious and philosophically motivated parallel societies. What a hypocrisy that is. What a hypocrisy. The family currently residing in Tennessee was granted asylum in 2010 by immigration judge Lawrence O. Berman, but that grant was overturned by Board of Immigration Appeals in 2012. So now anyway, they've turned it down so they might just send them back and they'll just grab their children off them. And it's, it's a good family, you know, and they're hardworking and all the rest of it, but they have odd ideas like Christianity and Obama, Obama and all his boys behind them, especially the boys behind them really hate Christianity. Yep, they do. And it's up to you to find out why. Most folk in Europe had never heard of the College of Europe. The College of Europe was uh, set up quietly at the end of World War II to train bureaucrats in, in, in what they had planned for eventually not a free trade association, uh, as they called it, a trading association, economic Union, but a total integration of Europe. They lied for years, right until the 90s. That's when they admitted the truth to the public, that they'd actually planned this since then. Anyway, the College of Europe, the training ground for European Union civil service since the end of the Second World War, has denied censoring an article by a former student depicting European Commission President Jose Manuel Barroso as a shallow politician without credibility or any sense of the crisis now shaking the foundations of Brussels. College staff say they took down the article from the institution's newly launched blog because the author had not put his name to it as was required by rules, not because of his criticism of the man leading the institution where many students end up working. And it tells you who pens it, Alfonso Ricciardelli, who spent a year at the college's uh, Brooks campaign in Belgium between 2008 and 9. The piece's uh, damning of Barroso's prediction made last week that European federalism was just a few years away. That means total integration, no your, your, your sovereign country's parliaments will be little provincial councils, which they almost are already, by the way. Entitled Barroso's Promise of a Federal Europe is, is an insult, the article, since reported to the blog, underlined the breadth of the gulf between the Brussels elites and Europe's voters. Talk of federalism is com- incomprehensible at a time of waning EU confidence and economic recession. I mean, they've all been plundered by this new bank they've set up for the, the Central Bank for Europe. Uh, Ricard Delit writes, The President's State of the Union's address, what a pompous and inappropriate name for the past three years, have certified the state of denial of the crisis, of the institutional turmoil, of the decadent role of the European Commission itself. That article continues, The legacy of these eight years of Barroso's presidency is evident and could be easily summarized. A few unconvincing speeches, a constant incapacity to negotiate from an even position with national politicians and with other institutions, and a lack of initiative that classes so stridently with the abundance of declarations of principle. So it's what you're complaining about here is the fact that they're supposed to, under all the chronology agreements they made over many, many years, and it's telling the public it was just to do with trade, etc., and you still be national, you have your national sovereign countries, and he's, he's basically saying that the intention was never to give you and leave you with sovereignty, but to take it all away. And it's been a disaster. 
and it will continue to be a disaster financially too. And also, in Britain, they're stepping up, snooping on the average person for taxes. The tax man is increasingly snooping on the private lives of the taxpayers with officials accessing thousands of pieces of personal information over the past year it merged. They're all doing it now. All the countries are doing it, by the way. It says it compares to more than uh, 11,500 such views in 2010, which equates to a rise of almost 25%. That's, that's snooping, according to stats released under the Freedom of Information Laws. Using the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act of 2000, Her Majesty's Revenue Collection Agency can access details on what websites are, are viewed by taxpayers, where a mobile phone call you made or received, and the date and time of emails, texts, and phone calls. From October 2011 to the end of September last year, HMRC was given 172 authorizations for directed surveillance, covert surveillance, mainly in public places. This has decreased from the previous year, but critics today accuse tax officials of pursuing wrong targets. It says the HMRC should be focusing on the estimated £35 billion lost tax, not snooping on hard-working people, said Stephen McPartland, the Conservative MP for Stephen H., who's campaigning for large companies to be more open about tax. It's not clear how many times the surveillance has led to successful prosecution for tax evasion or where those found to be innocent are told that they have been spied on. Well, of course they won't tell them. So they're going after just the average Joes, not the big corporations, you see. But that's always, we live in corruption, folks. It's, you don't have anything called democracy, equality, etc. Back with more after this. Hi, folks. Brett, cutting through the matrix and... Mark Carney is the, the governor of the Bank of Canada, uh, a rather obscure place. Uh, this uh, bank, actually is very undefined what exactly the Bank of Canada is anymore, except a meeting place where where some government reps meets uh, lenders and arrange loans. That's really what it is today. Anyway, uh, Mark Carney, the governor, he gave a, a long talk on Canada and, and uh, the state of the finances in Canada, etc., etc., and lots of upbeat talk with hoorays for this and hoorays for that and, and so on. Remember in Canada, too, before I get into this, it says, remember, I mentioned that uh, when all the bailouts were happening in the U.S. and elsewhere, Canada, there was just not a peep coming out of Canada, except that everything was fine in Canada. We weren't in the same mess as the U.S. Four years after it, in 2012, uh, it was admitted for the first time that the government had been bailing out some of the biggest banks in Canada. But that's how they treat people in Canada, you know. And most Canadians don't mind that kind of being treated that way. So they're different, to strange culture. But anyway, there's a PDF on this talk that Carney gave. I'll put it up. But it goes into near the three quarters of the way through. It says, third, Canada has clear and credible recovery and resolution mechanisms, including lender of last resort policies a deposit insurance scheme which with risk-weighted premiums and bridge banking powers that enable the rapid closure of failing institutions and the swift reopening of their viable operations. In its most recent budget, the federal government announced it will consult stakeholders on how best to implement a bail-in regime, that's thieving of the depositor's cash, to recapitalize failing Canadian banks that are systematically important to our domestic economy through the very rapid conversion of certain bank liabilities into regulatory capital. So if you have a certain amount of, uh, X amount of money in the bank over a limit, uh, they're going to steal it all from you. It's, they're already working on it hard, and they're, they're doing this, folks, because it's going to happen. They don't do this unless they know it's all going to happen. They're doing it across in Britain, they're doing it in Canada, they're doing it in the States, they're doing it across the board. And again, the Bank for International Settlements and the IMF is behind a lot of this pushing. They've actually said that. And of course, these, again, these banks will plunder you all, lose nothing, like, like the last time the taxpayers bailed them all out, and they'll still be operational after it. We're going to be scalped, is what it means. Uh, how else do you think they're going to bring in austerity? That's a big plan, you know, austerity. 
and eradication of any semblance of a middle class. You don't really have middle class now today. You're either a, a billionaire. You know, a millionaire is nothing today. You can lose that so quickly. But so you would be in the billionaire class, even preferably the multi-billionaire class. And then you have all the rest of us down below. And that's what they want. And it's the old communist system, again, that was funded by the Western banks. The whole communist system was funded by big Western banks, mainly in the U.S. and in London, New York and London. They financed the communist revolution. And that, that is history. It's historical facts. You can check it all up yourself. And they like that kind of system because they would eradicate competition of people who already existed in those countries for newcomers to come in, a certain newcomers, a particular newcomer, in fact. And they're going at it again for the next phase, and in austerity for us all. From Hamish, myself, in Ontario, Canada, it's good.